lot of chilling. It's back. Well, it didn't really ever go anywhere. It's kind of been looming around in the background for quite some time. But it's back and it's back today. In fact, I'm meant to be load shed this afternoon. So I need to sort that out. People always react when load shedding comes back or we have a little stint of load shedding. That's where things happen and then people tend to forget about it after a while. But unfortunately, I do believe load shedding is still here for a couple of years. You know, ESCOM is in a pretty, pretty bad state. Although there's good direction now, it's going to take a long time to get it back to where it needs to be to be able to provide us constant quality electricity at the capacity we require. And one of the things we're going to have to do to get it there is to endure more load shedding so more units can be taken offline to maintain for the proper amounts of time going forward. Which means that I think, honestly, we are going to be facing load shedding for a few more years. So now was the time to make an investment in new batteries. For quite a while, I've been thinking about doing an inverter system with batteries. A couple of years ago, I actually bought an inverter. It was a sine wave, modified sine wave inverter, but it did what it needed to do. It's, um, it's running the, the security, it's running some critical things, the internet, the server. It's got a couple of things on it. And to that, I've got six alarm size batteries, seven and a half hour batteries connected. And that worked pretty well at the beginning, but those lead acid batteries really don't last that long, especially if you take them all the way down to zero. And that's happened a couple of times with loads shedding stints. It used to make it four hours, now it's down to two. And it really doesn't have a lot of load on it. So I've been toying with the idea for quite some time to put on bigger batteries. I've looked at big lead acid AGM batteries. I've looked at solar batteries. I've looked at flooded uh, lead acid batteries. I've looked at all sorts of options. But what I've eventually settled on is biting the bullet and going lithium ion. Now lithium ion batteries are more expensive. However, they give you a lot more usable capacity inside the battery. So where you've got maybe a 100 amp hour lead acid battery or AGM battery, uh, you can use at most 50% of that battery. And immediately that's already going to reduce your life cycle of that battery significantly. I think some batteries, once you've gone down to 50% charge, you're probably going to only be able to do that a couple of hundred times at most. And then those batteries are just not going to be able to hold the same sort of charge anymore. So lithium-ion batteries will allow you to take the battery potentially all the way down to zero, but you sort of want to operate it at the 80 to 90% capacity. So I can use 80% of my lithium-ion battery capacity, which means that I only need half the overall capacity to get the same output as a lead-acid battery. And when you look at the maths like that, the price doesn't really, isn't really very different. So that's the option I've decided to go. Now, specifically what I've done is I've decided to buy a lithium ion battery cells. This is a lithium ion battery, 120 amp hours, 3.2 volts. And these, the ones that I've bought, are actually what they call second life cells. Now, a second life cell is a cell that's come out of some sort of application, like a electric bus, an electric car, something that required a lot of energy all at once. They needed to deliver large amounts of current almost instantaneously to run whatever these things were installed in. Now they can only do that for a finite amount of time and then their ability to deliver those high currents sort of deteriorates to a point where it's not really useful anymore. And then what happens is these batteries come out, they get refurbished and they get sold the second life batteries. Now second life battery still maintains the same capacity, it just doesn't have that high current output anymore. And that's fine for a backup situation because you don't need to be drawing huge peaks of current. What you need is constant capacity that you can deliver at a constant, relatively low current to keep your lights on, to keep your house running, to do what you need in a backup situation. You know, if you wanted to start a big machine, not what you need. But if you want backup power, perfect. They're a little bit cheaper and they're available locally in South Africa. There are a couple of people importing them and they're relatively well priced, especially when you look at it compared to an AGM battery where you need twice the capacity. Now my inverter is a 24 volt inverter, which means I need eight of these batteries in series to get to 24 volts. The higher your battery voltage, the lower the current that you draw out of the batteries. And the lower the current you draw out of the batteries, the better it is on their overall lifespan. And that's what you want to do. So you get 12 volt inverters, which are fine, but you are going to hammer your batteries a bit harder, unless you have a lot of batteries. And as you go up, 24 volts, then the next one up that's pretty commonly used is a 48 volt inverter. Now that's the best case scenario, in my opinion, is to have a 48 volt inverter, but it also means you need a minimum of 16 cells 
And if you want to expand on capacity more than 120 amps, you're going to need um, another 16 cells. So you have to build that system in 16 cell sections. So it doesn't really affect me. I've got a 20 volt, 4 volt inverter already, and that's what I'm going to make for myself. So as well as these batteries, I've got this, and this is a BMS, and that's a battery management system. And what this does is you connect it to your battery pack. Firstly, it limits the charge and discharge current of your batteries. I've bought one that's got a 30 amp charge and a 60 amp discharge limit, and that's more than sufficient for my needs and my inverter capacity or capabilities. The other thing it does is it monitors each one of the cells individually and balances them to make sure that they're all sitting at the correct voltage all the time so you can get the best possible output from your batteries and also you get the best possible lifespan. Now a second life battery like this has probably got a lifespan of around 2000 cycles, so it's 2000 discharge charge cycles. Now that's not a full discharge, that's even a partial discharge and recharge, but that in itself is pretty good. It's almost, well, it's more than six years. So that is completely fine. And after those 2000 cycles, this battery will still have 80% of its total capacity left, which is perfect. So in reality, in terms of a normal use case, the expected lifespan of something like this is at least 10 years, even though it's a second life battery. And that's why I chose these. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect these all up into essentially one 24 volt battery. I'm going to connect on my BMS system and then we're going to install it in the house. So these are my eight battery cells. Now I've tested them all and they're all showing about 3.28 volts, which is exactly what they should be. And I'm going to build them into a configuration that kind of is this shape. And I think that this shape is a good shape because it's going to fit in uh, both locations I've identified where this could potentially go. One thing I'm just trying to decide is how to connect them or how to get them to stay in the shape and I think what I'm going to need to do is tape them up with a bunch of masking tape to make them into one solid thing. So let me just check that. The other thing I've got here is the way I'm going to connect these batteries together. I've got these little um, plates or uh, connectors. They're made out of aluminium and these things can either fit like this that way or they can go Hopefully, this way. And it looks like they will fit that way. Although not necessarily straight, but that should be fine. Let me try and get these into the right configuration first. You want to alternate your poles. Because remember, we connect them as a series. So here's the positive. Here's, sorry, that's the negative. Positive, and here we want to kind of connect it like this. You want a negative here, positive, and you're going to connect it all the way down. And at the one end, we'll just bridge across and do the same thing up. And then we'll have two terminals at the end. We will connect our battery management system and our outgoing cables. is basically all the cells nicely stuck together it's pretty steady it's pretty sturdy but in total weighs about 22 kilos which is not too bad when you compare it to a lead acid battery uh, which will probably weigh for a 100 amp battery around about the same weight now i just want to talk about lithium ion a bit so there are arguments that lithium ion is not actually that good it's not very environmentally friendly and it's true you know mining lithium lithium um is not the most environmentally processed. It's difficult to recycle and dispose of. So that's where these second life batteries really come into effect. It really helps to increase, or it's, part, it's almost part of the recycling chain of a lithium ion battery. Because these have done their useful life in like an electric vehicle application already, but now they are going to be reused in a power, a power storage uh, system. And they're going to be used because they've, they've can't provide what they needed there but now they can provide new use to a new application and that's what's important about the second life lithium ion batteries because they can they increase the value chain of the system so now these will probably be good for another decade and by then you know uh, hopefully there will be in advances in recycling techniques there will be a better way to dispose of lithium and um, and that really helps the other thing that people sometimes are worried about lithium ion batteries is they think about a cell phone battery. And if a cell phone battery gets punctured, you know, it explodes. 
So that's a slightly different chemistry. What these are is lithium iron phosphate batteries or LIFEPO4. And these are not as volatile as those sort of batteries. If you puncture one of these, it's not going to burst into flames and explode, which makes them great for this sort of application. And it's another reason they get used in things like electric vehicles, because if they're in an accident, you're not going to have a car burst into flames. So for your house, also pretty safe. Nice thing to use. They don't release any gas like some lead acid batteries as well. They can release hydrogen. That can be a hazard in itself if it's not vent enough ventilation. So overall, there's a, there's a lot of good cases made for lithium ion batteries. Okay, I'm going to connect up all my, uh, well, I'm going to start telling out how I'm going to get all my connectors on here. I've also got to connect up all these lines. So if you look at your BMS, it actually counts, I think, from the bottom where this guy plugs in here. And this is obviously your negative. That goes on to your first negative point, and then you've got to count the eight cells. And all these red lines go to the positive battery cells. So this goes on to your first positive, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. And these guys connect in line with your negative and then out to your supply. And that's how you control the charge and also how you manage this battery pack. So I'm going to do that at the same time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use these guys like this. Put a bolt in and between this bolt and this guy here i think i will put the um put the lug these are the lugs that i'm going to use and the reason i'm going to do it between these bolts and not underneath is because i want to uh main well, maximize the surface area of this link with these and i don't want to just to limit it to that little space there so i think that'll be a better way to do it so i've got uh, lugs i've got bolts i've got spring washers so we can make this nice and secure so I don't really have a nice crimper for this, but um, I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to strip these wires a bit further back, and then I'm going to put on the lugs. Now, these cables are not um, really delivering a lot of current. They're more for monitoring each cell and balancing it. So it monitors voltage, a little bit of current. Your main charge is coming through your BMS, through the batteries as a complete system. Another tip I'd like to give you if you're doing work like this and you need to use these lugs and you don't have a proper crimper, or even if you do have a proper crimper, by spares. You don't want to bugger up one lug and then uh, not be able to finish your job because you don't have a spare lug. Always, always, always buy spares. Nuts, bolts, lugs, anything you work with. Make sure that you have spares. Made all my connections. Now we're ready to start hooking up these cells. Now what I'm going to do is only at the end I'm going to connect up the main battery leads and before I do that I'll put the final terminals on the end, tape them off to insulate them and then I'll make the connections. We don't want to accidentally cause a short and also we just want to make it safe until we're ready to actually do something. Okay so I want to make this relatively neat and what I think I'm going to do is sort of run the cables and like this, I don't know maybe we can work it out as we go. There we go. And there's our battery and there's our negative and our positive terminal. So if I just measure this, it should be 24 volts. If you do that. Okay, cool. 26.2 and that's what we would expect for the battery. It's fully charged. I just want to take a little bit of time and make all these cables quite nice and then we will carry on. Okay, that's looking nice and neat. Let me just do something around the edge here. In the meantime, I just want to go through and just make sure everything's nice and tight. Not too tight, but tight enough to make you know a good connection. You've got a lot of current that's going to flow through this battery, so you want to make sure that your, your connections are solid. But you definitely don't want to strip those thin little aluminium threads that are in the battery. If you tighten it and it suddenly gets loose, you coughed up. Okay, ready for the battery management system. So this guy can now plug in here, which is cool. And then what we're gonna do is connect up these cables. Now, the way these cables are, you get a B plus or B minus rather, that goes onto the battery negative, which is this one here. And then you've got a, um, a P minus, which is goes out and that's your outgoing power line. So 
I think my BMS is going to have to sit around about here and put a lug on here and it's going to connect to this terminal. But before I do that, I want to make up these final leads because I want to make them up, connect these two cables together, make up my positive lead, and then insulate them before I make a connection. So this cable I'm using is like a solar cable. Well, they call it solar cable, and it's often used connecting up solar panels to inverters. So it's low voltage, but high current. As you can see, it's got a big stranded core on the inside. And I think this one is rated for about 120 plus amps. It's eight American wire gauge, which is a stupid number. But um, nevertheless, we will use it. So American wire gauge for some unknown reason to me. The smaller the number, the bigger the cable. So an 8 cable is bigger than a 16 cable, bigger than whatever size they go to. I don't really know how that works because it kind of feels like they've maxed out their max size of cable because it's the lowest number. I'm not too familiar with American wire gauge, but I think it is dumb. Here in South Africa, we use proper things like millimeters squared, and that will give you an exact idea of how much capacity cable can carry because it's rated according to the square millimeters of copper in the cable. Perfect. Put, put some tape around there right now before I forget and before we connect it onto this battery. Now with all the lugs put on it's time to just make the final connections. So like I said before this goes onto the battery side. And then this goes out. So what I want to do is just connect up my outgoing battery lead in the meantime. What I'm going to do with to do that is I'm just going to use a bolt and washers on either side of that bolt just to make a nice good connection between those two cables. And then I will tape it up nicely. Now we're up to the final bit of assembly. BMS is going to slip clip on here somewhere and there you have it one hundred and twenty amp hour 24 volt battery pack connected and ready for use so now it's time to connect the inverter this is my inverter it's a Cenevo it's something I bought a couple of years ago from one of my uh, work suppliers, actually. Now, this is very similar to the ones that you get all over the place. Um, in those power carts, Mesa cells, hundreds of them, I'm sure. Um, you get them all over the place. And these, I mean, the guts are pretty, pretty damn similar. It's got the same specification. This one's physically just a little bit smaller. But um, when I bought this, it was less than half. Of what they cost now obviously with all the increased load shipping prices have just skyrocketed so i'm going to connect this onto the back here and then we can plug in the inverter power up something switch off the power and see that the battery bank is actually working okay so i've connected up my battery to my inverter i've connected power and i've connected this load and as you can see it's all on the inverter's on um, so what i'm going to do now is remove power from the inverter and the light shouldn't go off. Okay, that was a failure because the inverter wasn't actually switched on. Let me just try again. Power on. Inverter on. Okay. Now the inverter is actually on. So what I'm going to do is now unplug and we should keep the lights on without any sort of flickering. Here we go. Now we're running off batteries. So we can see that the batteries are working. We're not going to try and run them down now. This is a tiny little light. It's only 30 watts. But um, at least we can see that our connections are all working. So the next step is to switch this noise off and then we'll talk. So as it is, this is a backup solution. This battery bank as is with this inverter, which is a 2400 uh, VA inverter. It's about 1.4 kilowatts um, that it can deliver at a peak. This should keep my house running with essential lights, TV, uh, internet, all that sort of stuff on for close to 10 hours, I think. That's what I would expect to get out of this battery bank. Big improvement on the small batteries I used to have there.
And also now I'm going to be able to add things like lights and I'm going to be able to add things like uh, a couple other things around the house. So you can do whatever you want with this now. So you can put this in a cabinet, you can put it in a box, you can make it a little setup for yourself, put it somewhere in your house and just plug what you want into it. For me, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to install this somewhere in the back of a cupboard. I'm going to install this in a cupboard. It's where it used to be. I'm just going to put the new batteries there now. And then I'm going to run the essential loads I used to run, which were the uh, security and the internet and the routers and things like that. And then I'm also going to connect in some essential plugs. So I'm going to run new plug circuits from the inverter to where I need the essential plugs. And I'm also going to run lights. And I'm going to do the same thing with the new circuits. Now, I'm not going to really show you that detail. because I'm not going to be here telling you what you can and can't do and what you should and shouldn't do. Um, you know, there's things that you can do which are fine. Maybe not 100% legal, but fine. Uh, and the things you certainly shouldn't do, um, you don't want to run something like uh, anything with a motor in. You put an inverter like this, a switch mode power supply. It's not good for the motor. It's not good for the inverter. You can have all sorts of issues with that. But you can definitely run the lights in your house. And you can tie into the lighting circuit in your house if you know what you're doing. Now, if you don't know what you're doing and you're not comfortable with electricity, I definitely wouldn't recommend you doing that. I'd rather get a professional in to make those sort of connections for you. But as a standalone system, this will work perfectly. For example, you could put this inverter and battery pack next to your TV somewhere, uh, plug in your TV, plug in your DSTV, plug in your internet, whatever you want directly into the inverter. And when load shedding comes, nothing will change. Now, I hope this is an interesting video for you. I hope it helps you with your load shedding. I'm going to go and install this in my house now. Uh, if you've got any comments, questions, let me know in the comments. Uh, if you like the video, consider giving it a like and consider subscribing to the channel. Until next time, stay safe.